Good evening, everyone. Good to see you again on a Monday night. I know it's a sacrifice being here. And I pray that the good Lord will bless you for honoring him with your presence tonight. And the one thing I can say to you is that there's always joy when you're in the presence of God. I heard testimonies. In fact, I've heard a couple of few testimonies already concerning how long of a day it has been and how rough of a day it has been. But don't you feel good being in the presence of God? When you start standing singing that my God is great, my God is greater, my God is awesome, you know, you just feel like all the pains and all the cares of the world just disappeared. And that's what I've been telling you about praise and worship. Man, I had a long day, a bad day, but look at your faces. You're smiling and you, you're happy. You feel like, man, I can do this. I can do this. I can endure through this because I know that I'm serving a powerful God who is able above all else. Thank you for making for making the sacrifice and 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 and, and believe it or not, I, I will continue to pray for you, for God to uh, reward you for your efforts and for your de uh, determination and commitment to serve Him in spirit and in truth and to do His will. Although it's not easy, especially in this island, on this island, it's not easy at all. Everybody's working long hours and have to wake up early in the morning. It's hard. But you can do it. You can do it. You can do it. You can do it. Tonight, I, pr I promise I will try my best to be as quick as possible so I can get you out of here. And then to, so that I'm, I, I, uh, I uh, can count on you again Thursday. I know we're not going to be here tomorrow, Tuesday, and Wednesday we will not be here. And, um, but we'll be back Thursday, Friday, and we'll end on Saturday. Now, one thing I want, would like to remind you is that Thursday, you do not want to meet, meet, uh, miss Thursday. Why? Because on Thursday, I will be focusing more uh, in the book of Revelation, where we're going to look at worship and the end time, especially for us Seventh-day Adventists who are a people of prophecy, a people of end time. So I, uh, I will be focusing on the importance of worship and the end time. So be here for these uh, three sermons that we'll be preaching on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Be sure to, uh, to invite your friends and relatives who have been missing out that they should come and listen, uh, participate in this with us. And as well, I would like to say thank you for those who are watching online. I know uh, I, my wife uh, actually watched one of those sermons online and she gave me a feedback. I don't know if she's watching now or not, but I would like to say thank you for watching, all who are watching live. Uh, maybe those who are watching later on, uh, the recording that Pastor is going to load um, on the website, those who are watching as well later on, we say thank you for watching and hopefully that these messages will be a blessing to you and to your family and to your home. So we say peace be upon you. Tonight, we are going to look at this title, Who is God that I may worship him? Who is God that I may worship him? I'm going to invite you to go quickly with me to the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 5. Exodus chapter 5. This is where we derive the title for the message tonight. Although we will not go to stay too much on the, this narrative, which is a beautiful story, uh, but we'll just glance at it real quick. And now we're going to read from verse 1 through 4. Verse 1 to 4 in Exodus chapter 5. And in Old Testament, second, second book in the Old Testament. When you have it, let me hear you say amen. As you know, I'm reading it from my new international version. Still is beautiful. So follow along with me. Here we are reading, it says, afterwards, okay, afterwards. When they say afterwards, you know, something happened before. Now, I'm sure you remember all the stories of Moses, um, what happened to him when he was a baby, being taken in by the daughter of Pharaoh and was raised as one of them and he was supposed to be Pharaoh of Egypt and all this good stuff. And then he saw uh, an Egyptian beating up, beating up on a poor Israelite and he defended that Israelite and ended up killing that Egyptian, and he fled to the wilderness, all this good stuff. Now, afterward, 
okay? Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh, okay? You remember in the chapter before, chapter 3, 4, you received commission to go back to Egypt, and God said, I'm going to use you as an instrument to deliver my people from Pharaoh, and they will come to the wilderness to worship me. And go ahead and tell Pharaoh, this is my mandate. Now afterward, Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said, this is what the Lord God of Israel says. Let my people go so that they may hold a festival to me in the desert. The word festival means they, that they should go and worship me in the wilderness. Pharaoh said, who is God or who is the Lord that I should obey him and let Israel go? I do not know who the Lord is and I will not let the Israel go, Israelites go. And they said, God of the, the, the and, and, and Moses and Aaron said, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. Now let us take the three-day journey into the, de, uh, to, into the desert to offer sacrifices to the Lord, in other words, to worship the Lord, our God, or he may strike us with, with, with plagues or with the sword. But the king of Egypt, Pharaoh, said, Moses says to Moses and Aaron, why are you asking the people, why are you asking, sorry, why are you taking the people away from the labor? Get back to your people. All right, get back to work. Get back to work. And when, when and, and then Pharaoh said to Pharaoh said, look, the people of the land are now numerous, and you are stopping them from working. Father God in heaven, this is your word, and these are your people. Speak, O oh Lord, for your servants are listening. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So we see that the question Pharaoh asks is, who is the Lord that I may obey him and let his people go in their wilderness to worship him? Who is the Lord? Now, of course, the title of the sermon I said is, uh, who, is, who, is who is God that I may worship him? A little bit nuances of a difference from Pharaoh's question to the question that I'm asking, but the, 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 the implication is all the same. Who is the Lord that I may worship him? As you recall, uh, the God of Israel is called what? He's called Yahweh, okay? He's called Yahweh, and uh, we'll, we'll touch base on that later. So when Moses went to him, Moses said to Pharaoh that Yahweh sent me to you and said, let my people go. Now, Pharaoh didn't even know who Yahweh was, okay? And he was like, hey, hey listen, man, who is God that I may obey him and let his people go in the wilderness to worship him? Now, who is God that I may, that I may obey his voice? This was the cry of Pharaoh when Moses came to him and saying, God said, let my people go. Pharaoh was aware of many gods. He grew up in a culture of, of many, many, many gods, okay? They worship many, many, uh, many gods, idols, okay? Statues like bull and, and snakes and etc. They worship everything that, that, they worship everything that has breath as God. He knew so many gods, all right? He knew many names of different gods they worship. Okay? In fact, the people within the kingdom, within the kingdom of, uh, of Pharaoh considered him as a god. So Pharaoh himself was considered a god. Pharaoh never heard of this god, Yahweh. He was surprised to learn that there is another god besides himself and beside the multiple gods that he knew of in Egypt. Thus the question, who is the god that Yahweh, all right, who is the Lord, who is Yahweh, who is God that I may his voice. Now, looking back in the narrative, if we go to chapter 3, when God appeared to Moses from the burning bush, Moses was not sure that the Israelites would know who God was. So he asked, when I tell the people God sent me, what shall I say when they ask me the question, what is God's name? Who is God? And God said to Moses, when they ask you who is God, what should I say? And God said, well, you should say, I am who I am. And that's where the name Yahweh is derived. Actually, the word, that, that is the verb to be in Hebrew. So Yahweh means that just I am. I'm just him. Okay, that's who I am. So now, 44 years, now they were supposed to know about Yahweh because Yahweh appeared to their father before, before slavery. Remember, God appeared to Abraham and had this nice conversation to Abraham and told him, hey, this is what I'm going to go through, do through you. And God told, appeared to Isaac and we, we repeated the covenant, the, the, the promise. And God appeared to Jacob, the same thing. So they, they're supposed to know who Yahweh was, but after 400 years in slavery, 
you know, a lot of children were born, well, not a lot, many, many, almost all of them were born, millions of them were born into slavery. So they didn't even know who Yahweh was. Okay? We have been talking about praise and worship for the past few days. Praise, worship, power, praise, invisible power, praise, and the dead cannot praise God. How to praise God high and lifted up. God is the God of the universe in control all the time. But still the important question is, we have not answered yet, is who is God that we may obey his voice and worship him? Glad you've been talking about that, all that, Pastor. This is very nice. We're talking about God and high and lifted up. Praise God, worship God, pray to God. But who is God? And some people are still asking that question today. Who is God that we may obey him and worship him? Who is God that we may worship him? Now, some people are saying, well, you know, this song sounds so nice. You know, every praise to our God, every word of worship, it's one accord, every praise, every praise to our God. But I, I, people are still asking, I need to know, I need to know who's God that I worship him. You know, I can jump and say hallelujah to our God. I can do that. I can, I can jump and sing glory to our God. But first I need to know who is that God. And like the Israelite like today, those people are, a lot of people are wondering who is God. And then, you know, God is asking me to spend my precious hours, to commit my precious hours, to commit my precious uh, talents and my, my valuable skills to praise and worship him. But who is it? Here's what we learn, okay? First, we must ask ourselves this question. Where and how can we learn about this God? Where can we learn about God? And where, how can we learn about God? First, we must look at uh, 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 different venues, different areas, different, different uh, 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 places we can learn about God. First, we can look at the, uh, the book of nature, according to the Bible. The Bible says that from the book of nature, which we call the general sources of knowledge about God, you know, from the book of nature, we can learn about God. The Bible says in Psalm 19, 1 to 3, which we're not going to have time to go through it right now, but write it down. It says, the heavens declare the glory of God. Okay, so therefore we know that from nature, we can learn about who God is. We can learn about who God is from nature. And then furthermore, we, we read from Romans chapter uh, 1, 19 and 20, which we will come back to later on at the end. It says, everything that humanity needs to know. Now listen, this is very important. Romans chapter 1, 19, 20. Write it down. Uh, the general revelations about God, nature, that this, this knowledge is available to all. This knowledge is available to to, to, the, to Chinese, available to Japanese, available to Americans, to Africans, to Haitians, available to all, it is available to all. It's general knowledge in nature. Heavens declare the glory of God. The, everything you see, the stars, the moon, and the formations of them all declare the glory of God. Now, Romans chapter 1, 19, 20 says, everything that humanity needs to know about God is revealed clear and plain. Clear and plain. God has shown this, his visible and invisible attributes throughout everything he made. Everything God created, all right, bear his signature. So his, internal, his, his eternal power, invisible, both visible and visible, can be seen through nature. His divine nature can be seen through the book of nature. So we can learn from God. Now, I want you to turn with me real quick, real quick. That one i like to read with you. Job, the book of Job chapter 12. Okay, let's go to Job chapter 12. Real quick, real quick. Let's go to that one because that one is, uh, 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 is very, uh, very nice. I want you to see how through nature you can learn about God. And I give you a lot that I, I, I want you to write those down when you're talking about people, about who God is, when people are asking those questions, and, and that they should have no excuse, by the way. Romans chapter 19, 20 says, they should have no excuse because knowing God is made plain throughout the universe that we can learn about God. And by the way, just by the way, a, 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 a passing note, okay, passing note. Uh, 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 this is why science and religion all right, has something in common because science says study nature and observation is everything. So through observations of nature, we can learn about God. When they're being amazed by the genetic code, and they're like, oh, man, we don't know how this is formed. Oh, I know how this is formed. I can tell you that my God did it. When they tell you how the cells are so amazing, like the other day I was watching the science, scientist guy got so fired up about the, 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 the cells, and they're so tiny, but they're so active, and they died every day, but they, they renewed, and he was like, oh, my God. I'm like, well, don't get so excited. I know, because my God made it. 
in my, my, my the, the Psalm one nineteen Psalm one th- uh, three nine says that 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 I am wonderfully, fearfully, and wonderfully made. So I know God's work is fearful and wonderful. So you'll be in a mess right now. I'm saying, that, well, you're a little bit led, brother, because the Bible has revealed that to us a long time ago. However, their discoveries are very important for us to even proclaim the glory of God. All right, so now we look at uh, Job chapter 12, okay? Here we go. Here we go. I want you to write this one down. Very important. 12, 7, and, 12, 7 and 10. Okay, I'm going to take that very slow. Okay, let's read it together. Here we go. It says, but, okay, ask the animals and they will teach you. So who should we ask about God? Ask the animals and they will teach you. Ask the birds of the air and they will tell you. Or speak to the earth and it will teach you. Let the fish of the sea inform you about our God. Which of these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this? My God. They all know that the hand of God made them. And this in his hand is the life of every creature. What, is what, say? what does it say? The hand of God is the life of every creature. Meaning that everything that has breath, everything created in heavens and on earth were made by God. And so Job is saying, look, if you don't know, ask the beasts. That's talking about the dry land life. And he said, the, 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 talks about the birds, pest life, talking about the bushes, vegetation, talking about fish, marine life. Go out there and ask. And if you observe long enough, and if you take the time to ask a question, you will learn about the great God you serve. The heavens declare the glory of God. Ask, and they will tell you. Ask, and they will testify. And they all know that they were made by God. Every living things, every living thing testifies of God, who God is. By observing nature, we can learn a lot about who God is. God is revealed in everything he created, and the Bible says it is made plain. That's the book of nature. Second place we can learn about God, okay? Second place to go and learn about God is what we call scripture, the book of scripture, God's, God's word, the Bible, Okay? We call that special revelation. The first one I give you, we call it general revelation. Available to all. Now we're talking about uh, 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 the, book, the, the book of scripture with a special or specific revelation. That's God's word, the Bible. Not available to all. There are places that they don't have Bible, okay? They don't know about the word of God. But even though they don't know about the word of God, they don't have the specific revelation or special revelation, God, God, uh, God's words, the Bible. But they know about God because the Bible says they will have no excuse because everything they need to know about God is made plain through nature. But the second book is the book of Scripture. 2 Timothy 3, verse 15, 17, which you know, I'm sure most of you know it very well. It says, all of Scripture is God, God breathe." Meaning that they come into existence by God, by divine power, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Second Peter 1, 19, 21 said, Bible writers were, were inspired by God to write in accordance to God's will. So the Bible writers have, have revealed God's will, revealed, revealed, uh, revealed God's knowledge in their writings, okay, as inspired by the Holy Spirit. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 through 4 says that Jesus the son of the living God is the most perfect revelation of God. In other words, if we, Jesus just, 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 the, just the climax of this whole revelation thing, okay? When Jesus came, he made perfect the revelation about who God is. So if you want to know who God is, just follow the life of Jesus. How did he live? Live his life. How did he behave? How? And then by that, when you study Jesus... Then you will know who God is. You remember the one question one of his disciples asked, Jesus, show us the Father, show us God. Jesus said, I've been with you all along, and you still don't know who I am. How silly I've been telling you. This is me. He said, Hey, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father, because we are one. All right. So therefore, if you need to know who God is, who must you study first? Study Jesus. Study Jesus. Okay. Heaven and earth. And now Jesus, whom we need to study to know about God, made this statement, which is very powerful and very important. He said, heaven and earth will pass, but not even an iota in the word of God will fade away. 
So Jesus is saying, this is very important. This is very valuable to learn about God's will, God's purpose, God's plan for your life. And to learn about the very nature and character of God. And so we have, we have internal evidences. We have external evidences of who God is. And that this is the most important revelation. Jesus is the, the highest form of revelation of God. But this is one of the most important, this is the most important revelation of God. Why I say that? Well, you, I'll tell you this in a minute. Now, there's a third way we can learn about God. Third way to learn about God is the book of experience. Okay? Personal experiences. Personal experiences. Who is God? You must have an experience with him to know who, it is, who he is. Psalm 19 says, how sweet are your words my, to my taste. How sweet are your words to my taste. That's someone who, had, who, who uh, has an experience with God. They are, they are sweeter than honey to my mouth. That the revelation of God. David busted out. I will bless the Lord at all times. And his prayer shall continually be in my mouth. That's a personal experience with God. Okay? Now, how do I know that? Because later on, while David is boasting about, well, I'll bless the Lord at all times. His prayer shall continually be in my mouth. Come and magnify the Lord with me. And he was going on and on. And he just said, oh, wait, 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 wait a minute. You may not even know who God is. You may not even know why I'm boasting in the Lord. You may not even realize why I'm so excited about God. And then he made this invitation. He said, come, taste, and see that the Lord is good. In other words, for you to get excited about God, in other words, for you to get excited about praising and worshiping God, you must know who God is. And for you to know who God is, you must have had an experience with God. And until you have an experience with God, you will never understand what I'm talking about. And you will never understand what the Bible writers are talking about. You will never understand why the praising people are so excited. You will never understand why the people are hooked on God are so hooked on God. You must have a personal experience with God. And David understood that very well. So he was like, oh, I will bless him. I will praise him. I will glorify him. But he said, wait, 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 wait. Come, taste for yourself. And you will see that the Lord is good. Then I will not have to tell you. You two will start boasting in the Lord. But you must, you must taste them first. You may read about the goodness of God. But until you experience the goodness of God yourself, you may never understand the goodness of God. The Bible says it's impossible for those... And the Bible says it is impossible for those who have tested the heavenly gift, the goodness of God. It is impossible after you have tested the goodness of God and you have shed the Holy Spirit and who have tested the goodness of, the goodness of God and the power of God to fall back to their old ways. Did you hear that? Hebrews chapter 6 verse 5. It is impossible after you have had an experience with God for you to go back to your old ways. Impossible. Impossible. Impossible after you have tested God to go back to your old ways. Now that you have tested God, according to Peter, now that you have tested God, tested that the Lord is good, now that you have tested that God is good, so like a newborn baby, like newborn babies, Peter is saying this, like newborn babies, you must crave pure spiritual milk so that you may grow up in your salvation. So after you have tested that, you see that God is good. Now you must crave more of him. Did you, did you get that? Crave more of him, more of him, more of him, more of Because when it is good, it is good, right? And if it is good, you must go after more, more. And Peter said, now that you have tested and see that God is good, you must crave more of him. And as you crave more of him, more of him you will grow closer and closer to him. As you grow closer and closer to him, you will also grow up in your salvation. Who is God? And what is his name? That was the question that was asked in the, in the chapter of Exodus chapter 5. One is asking who is God. Another group of people is asking what is his name? Now there are many derivative, derivative der, well there are many derived titles of God in the Bible. But only two names are foundationally significant. One of them is Elohim and one of them is Yahweh. I'm sure you have heard Elohim, you have heard Yahweh before. In Genesis chapter 1, 1 the first word, the first name for God appeared as Elohim. 
And then later on in Exodus chapter 3, 4, when God appeared to Moses, when he said, what is your name? He said, my name is Yahweh. So now we must understand, okay, why? And the word Yahweh is the word which is Lord in English, okay? And the Hebrew children were not allowed to say that name because of Exodus 20, which said, thou shalt not take the name of thy God, and that God in vain. So instead of referring to Yahweh, they would never pronounce, they would never, still now, still now, they would not say the word Yahweh because they think it's offensive to God. So they came up with this, this substitute. They call it Adonai. Okay, Adonai. And you heard that in English. I'm sure you have heard Adonai many times before. The word Elohim appeared, occurs 2,000 times in the Bible. Okay, that's just without the derivatives. And derivatives of them are, for instance, El Shaddai, El Olam, El, etc. That's the, uh, some derivatives of the name Elohim. And Elohim is the transcendent God. That's why it appears in Genesis, an account of creation. And that this is the God that exists, but beyond his creation. Beyond his creative work. So this God is a mysterious God. He's inaccessible. He, 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 you cannot get to him. You cannot touch him. You cannot see him. You cannot understand him. That's the Elohim God. He's the God of creation. And then you have the other God. When God came to Moses, now he came closer to Moses. Right? Since he came closer to Moses and closer to his people, the covenantal name of God, the alliance name of God is the name Yahweh, which occurs about 6,500 times. To be sure, it's about five, uh, 6,519 times in the, in the Bible. And then the substitute Adonai occurred 433, 34 times. And so it'll give you a total of 6,843 times this name occurred in the Bible. What does this name mean? It means this God is eminent, eminent, existing, operating within the universe he created. So one name is saying that God is beyond, he's high and lifted up. Uh, he's beyond his creation. And then one is saying, but yet God interacts with his beings within creation. You ought to say amen for that. Because I'm trying to tell you that you're not serving a God that is so distant from you, all right, that you cannot talk to him, you cannot hear him, that he cannot hear you, that he cannot touch you. But you're serving a God that is so close to you, right? Every sight he heard, every time you can talk to him in silence, loud, however you want to talk to him, he is close enough to you. And you know, later on, you will see what he says. He is imminent, his presence is imminent, he is here. The book of nature, the book of experience, and the, the book of scripture reveals who God is. But we need to filter our experiences through scripture. We need to filter what we learn from nature through scripture. We need to filter everything that is coming to us, every knowledge, information coming to us about God through scripture. I must go faster. Now, what does the Bible say about God? So what are some of the attributes and characteristics in nature of God as revealed by nature, scripture, and personal experience. All right? Now, the very first book in the Bible, Genesis, say that in the beginning, in the beginning, God created what? The heavens and the earth. So by this, we know that God is the, is the creator God. So we know the Bible introduced God. The very first book, the very first chapter, the very first time the name of God is mentioned, it is mentioned as the creator of heavens and earth which means that this is what they call the the the, the uh, i think it's hyperbole that which i say that the heavens and earth represent everything in between now if i'm talking about the ceiling and the floor that means everything within just a part of god's creation okay so the first book the very first chapter the very first first verse and so this is god as creator god is transcendent that means he's far from us god is eminent which means that he's very close to us god is infinite he is self-existing without origin. God is immutable. He never changes in nature. God is self-sufficient. He has no needs in himself, in and of himself. God is omnipotent. He is all the powerful God. God is omniscient. He is all knowing. God is omnipresent. He is always everywhere. God is wise. He is full of perfect wisdom. God is faithful. He is, he, he is infinitely true and cannot lie. God is good. He is full of goodness and goodwill for all. God is merciful. He is full of compassion. God is just. He is the God of justice. God 
God is gracious. He is willing to serve the guilty ones. God is holy. He is perfect. God is gracious. He is perfectly beautiful. God is strong. God is the most high God. God God is eternal. God is everlasting. God is the provider. God is the healer. God is the sustainer. God is the light. God is the truth. God is the life. God is the savior. God is the redeemer. God is the sovereign, sovereign God. And God knows everything. God sees everything. God feels everything. God knows your name. Who is God that I may worship him? Now we come to the point that we've been talking about who is God. You know who God is. Now for everything that I've mentioned, these should give you enough reasons why you should jump up and excited about my God. Who is God that I may worship him? What is worship? Worship is offered with a humble and pure heart. God says, give me, uh, David says, give me an undivided heart that I may worship you. The true worship of God is essentially eternal, internal, internal. It happens in the inside. True worship happens in the inside. True worship is a matter of the heart and spirit stem from the knowledge and obedience to reveal, to the reveal uh, word of God. So true worship is based on everything that I've said. True worship is based on that. It's when you start to internalize who God is. And then when you internalize who God is, you, you take it all in. You take it all in. Then you start to exercise in that end. And you're writing poems and you're writing songs for God. And, and you're writing journals for God. And you cannot stop talking about who he is. You internalize it. And then you're burning in the inside about who he is, what he has done, what he is doing. And then, my God, and just, just keep internalizing it, internalizing it. And then you bust into praise. So for you to bust into praise, you must first know who God is. And you know who God is by internalizing him. So worship is to internalize God. Praise is the outburst, the external outburst about who God is. And you say, this is what we need, praise. He said, praise mostly of God, uh, uh, of God is freaking theme in the Psalms. Okay, when you read the Psalms, everywhere you turn to my, I will praise you, O oh God. I will praise you, O oh God. Okay, praise is a theme that prefers the entire Bible. Okay, throughout the entire Bible, you, you learn about a praise. When you go from, you can go from Genesis to Revelation. It's all about praise and worship, praise and worship of God. The words that they use often in parallel for praising God is praise. And also they talk about bless. They talk just like I was saying, bless, 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 okay, bless, exalt, extol, glorify, magnify, thanksgiving, confess, praise is all of that and more. But praise is an outward expression of what you have been internalized, which is worship. No matter what, we are going to praise, worship either God or something. No matter what, we're going to praise either God, or praise or worship God, or something. Why, you say, Pastor? Well, because we were made to praise and worship. We were created to worship. We were created to worship, so we must worship something. And if you don't know God to praise and worship him, you're going to praise and worship something. That's what the Egyptians did. They made up their own God. Okay, if you go to Psalm 115 and say that, you know, these people, they make up their own gods and the gods they made look like them. All right? In, in fact, let me go there with you right now. Let me go. Just give me a few minutes. We, let's go there to Psalm 115, please. Let, let's go to Psalm 115. I, I like to kind of look at that with you real quick. Okay? This, this is very nice. What, what, God, what, what, what the author is saying concerning these people and the God, uh, their gods. Okay? Let, 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 let's, let's watch this. Psalm 115. Real quick. Real quick. Okay? I think this is very important for us to, uh, to kind of uh, take, 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 take a quick look at this. Okay, Psalm 115. Listen to this real quick. It's very short. Not to us, O oh Lord, not to us, but unto your name be glory because your love and faithfulness. Okay, that's give us reason why we're praising and glorify God. Why do the nations say, where is their God? All right? why, the, why is their God? Meaning that, is there a God? Uh, God does not exist, stuff like that. And our God is in heaven. He does whatever pleases him. But their idols are silver and gold made by the hands of men. They have mouth, but they cannot do what? 
they cannot speak. They have eyes, but they cannot see. Huh? They cannot see. They have ears, but they cannot hear. They have nose, but they cannot smell anything. They have hands, but they cannot feel. They cannot touch, but they cannot. They have feet, but they cannot walk. Nor they utter sound with their throats. Those who make them will be like them. And so will all who trust in them. All right? Those who made them are like them. And they will, those, those who trust in them will be like them too. But our God is the living God. We, our God, does not look like us. But we look like our God. I hope you understand what I just said. Does that make sense to you, right? Their, their, their gods look like them. Because they made them out of gold and silver and woods and whatever. Or stones. But, our, but we were made by our God. In other words, we are not, we're not worshiping, we're not worshiping the created, but we are worshiping the creator. Okay? All right. Now, yeah, why must I praise God? Now, since we uh, were created to worship, we were created to worship. We must worship something. We're going to worship something. All right? Now, the Bible says the internal, uh, 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 the, the visible, the invisible attributes of God were made plain through, uh, throughout nature. And so we have reason and we have a way of knowing who to worship, when to worship, how to worship, why we're worshiping. Why are we worshiping God? Because God says, you must have no other gods except me. That's why we must praise and worship God. Why must I praise and worship God and uh, only God and, and nothing else? Because God said, you must have no other gods beside me. You know it, Exodus 20. And we must not make gods from anything in heavens and on earth and the waters below. God is a jealous God. Exodus 20. Say, look, I have made you. And every time you go worship something I have created, you are insulting me. And God said, I will not let you dishonor me like that. Now just imagine you have your son or daughter. All right, you give birth to them and you do everything to them. All right, and all of a sudden, they're looking at this neighbor, they're calling their brother, daddy. Every time they look at the neighbor, they say, neighbor, daddy, please, daddy, please. And you sit sitting there and be like, what's wrong with you? I am your father. But every time you come run to the neighbor, daddy, that would upset you, right? I'm sure my mother would say, for nine months I carried you. And for the rest of your life, I feed you, wash your clothes, I did everything for you. And this is how you're going to repay me? By calling a, a stranger mother and it disowned me? That's an insult. And so when you go worship idols and, and spirits and, and, and trees and whatever, you are insulting God. You are dishonoring your creator. And God said, I will not allow you to do this to me. God is saying, I know. I know you. God said, I know you. I know you. Meaning God knows each and every one of you. I know you. And I call you by name. Now, this is amazing. When I read this, I got excited, okay? Whenever I have issues and problems, I just remember that God knows. He knows my name. He knows my name. And there's a song that we sing all the time in praise and worship. He knows my name. He knows my every thought. He sees me when I fall and hear me when I cry. Because he knows your name. He knows. He knows my name. He knows your name. He knows all of our names. Individually. And he said, though you may not know my name. Now this is the sad thing, right? God said, now, now you may not know my name. But I know your name. Hallelujah. You may not know my name. But I know, you, I, 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 know, I know your name. You may not know who I am, but I know who you are. You may not know where I am, but I know where you are. You may not know what I'm doing, but I know what you are doing. I know your name. You say, I am the God. There is no other beside me. There is no God that people may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none besides me. I am the God. There is no other God. I form the light. And I create the darkness. I make, I make well-being and I create calamity. I am the God who does all these things. I am the God. I remember I didn't say I'm a God. He said I am the God. I made everything. You say, let, let the nations know. And when you come and praise and worship God, okay, that's all you are doing. You're letting the demons know that I know the God. Okay, you let in the whole world know that I know the God, the creator of heaven and earth. And when you praise and worship God, you let in the universe know I know the God. And certainly you let in God know I know who you are. And God said, you are my witnesses and my servant. 
know me. You are my witnesses and my servant. You must know who I am. Know me. Believe me and understand me. My God, God is just, ooh, it's just like, did you know, like sometimes, you know, I have this kind of conversation with my wife, you know, you know, when we first got married, it's always a little rocky when you first got married. Right? You're trying to get a climate, get to know each other. And then all of a sudden, we start talking about, well, you know, you're trying to build trust so they can believe you. When you say you're going to the store, that they believe you're not going somewhere else. All right? You say, baby, just, just believe me, okay? Yeah, baby, understand me, okay? Baby, understand me, okay? Baby, try to know me. Just, just know me. And when, when, they, 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 when they think you did something that you didn't do, you say, well, you just don't know me at all. You don't know me yet. Are you still learning about who I am? And God is to me, it seems like that, that this desperate lover who's saying to his people, you are my servant. You are my people. You are my witnesses. Know me. God wants us to know who he is. God said, believe me. God wants us to believe in him and what he's doing for us, that he has his, our goodwill at heart. And God said, understand me. There is no God before me. There is no God comparable to me. And there will never be a God after me. Isaiah 43.10. And by the way, the, everything I've just said, you find in Isaiah 45. When you have a chance to read it by yourself. And God said, I am the Alpha and the Omega. The first and the last. The beginning and the end. That's Revelation 22.13, which you know about. And you know, there's a hill song I love. It say, there is none like you. No one else can touch my heart like you do. I can search all eternity long and find there is none like our God. And we say, there's no God like Jehovah. There's no God that Jehovah because he's an awesome and powerful God. And God is his name. There is no God like our God. And then he will go, he will go as we come to a close. Nehemiah leads in praise. Nehemiah leading a praise team out of slavery. Nehemiah leading a, uh, leading a praise uh, team out of slavery. Say, blessed be your name, glorious. Blessed be your glorious name, O God. And may it be exalted above all in blessing and praise. You alone are the Lord. And as I've laid it on, say, sing praise to him. Tell of his wonderful acts. Okay, when you're praising God, you're telling about his wonderful work. Sing praise to the Lord for his glorious achievement. Glory to God in the highest. Praise is the legitimate response to God's self-revelation. Personal experiences, God's redeliverance, God's favors, all illicit praise. Praise consists in part of the spoken word. Open my lips, my mouth will declare your praise, said the psalmist, and my tongue shall sing aloud your righteousness, and sinners shall be converted to you, Psalm 51. When we praise and worship God, we are invited sinners to be conferred, uh, converted, to be transformed, to be uh, 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 changed by the God we serve. Praise requires a total personal commitment to praise God. I will praise you, O oh Lord, with my whole heart. I will tell of your marvelous works. I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. Psalm 9, verse 1 and 2. If you go through the psalm, you get excited just, just to praise. I will praise you, O oh God, with my whole heart. I will tell of your marvelous works. I will be glad and rejoice in you. And I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. Holy God prompts a heartfelt praise and worship who is God that I must praise and worship him who is God. Now, these questions people are still asking today. Recently in the news and magazine and all over the place, there's a posthumous uh, humorous, uh, uh, book of Stephen Hawkins that was released. And the title of it is Brief Answer to the Big Question. Big answer, uh, brief answers to the brief, uh, uh, sorry, brief answers to the brief questions. And the big question is, that to him, there's a big question. The big question is, is God real? Does God exist? Okay? Now, they, now he, listen to this. Listen to this. And I quote, The observable universe fashions itself without a cause. And has no, it has a net en energy of zero. Zero. The universe fashions fashion itself without a cause. That means the cause would have been God. So say it was without a cause, that means what? There is no, there is no creator, right? And he has net zero uh, uh, energy of zero. Now listen, if the universe adds up to nothing, okay, came from nothing, adds up to nothing, then you don't need a God to create it. See, I told you was coming to that eventually. Say that, so since it's not, the universe is nothing, the universe came from nothing, it's nothing, 
it has a net zero of zero, uh, net uh, uh, energy of zero, then you don't need a God to create it. The universe is the ultimate free lunch. That's what it says. The universe is the ultimate free lunch. All right? It's free for all. There's no owner. Nobody created this thing. It just appeared. So you and I are just accident. We just appeared. In fact, we are nothing. We came from nothing. And we are nothing. Now, before we came from monkeys. Now we, didn't, we don't even come from monkeys anymore. We came from nothing. Everyone is free to believe. As he, he continues to say, everyone is free to believe as he or she wishes. But in my opinion, the simplest explanation to the existence of the universe is that there is no God. Well, no disrespect to Mr. Hawking, but I have news for him and for those who believe the same thing. I believe, yeah, perhaps he was a brilliant scientist, right? Maybe he was. Maybe he was. And I'm not just take, saying anything that taking anything away from him. Maybe he was a brilliant scientist, right? But he lacked understanding. Because the Bible says, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They do abominable deeds. There is none who does what God requires them to do. The locks look down from heaven on the children of men to see if there are any who does good and understand and who seek after God. So the fool says in his heart, there is no God. So it's standing on the word of God. I am convinced that this man was a fool. Just because his scientific observations could not lead him to God, maybe he refused to let that happen. He declared the universe is nothing. It's free lunch. There is no God. The Bible says when you say there is no God, you are a fool. Because God is real. Now, today we still have the same problem. People are asking, well, who is God that I may worship him? Ah, they are confused. Some people are trying to trick God. Watch this now. Uh, during Elijah's time, during, his, during, uh, during, during the time of Elijah, he asked this question. How long will you waver between two opinions? If you believe Yahweh is God, follow him. But if you believe Baal is your God, follow him. Whatever, whatever choice you make, but you must decide. Okay, whatever choice you're going to make, make a choice. That's 1 King 18, 21. Joshua, during his time, gave similar challenge. Now fear God and serve him with all faithfulness. But if it appears hard for you to serve God, you must choose today whom you're going to serve. Either you're going to serve the living God or idols or demons. But as for me, in my house, I will serve God. Joshua 24, 14, 15. Jesus gives the same warning. You cannot serve both God and money. You cannot attach to God and be attached to materialistic things. You have to choose between God or money. You cannot be a friend of the world and then declare that you are a friend of God. So Jesus said, choose. Elijah said, choose. How long are you going to be balancing between the swing and between two opinions? Joshua said, listen man, choose. Whether you're going to serve demons or, or angels, whatever. But choose whom you're going to serve. You must make a decision. You only have two choices. You know, we're talking about religious syncretism. Religious syncretism is rejected by the Bible. These are the people who try to mix the worship of the one true God with other things. You cannot do that. You cannot worship God in other things. We're talking about Jesus rejected religious hypocrisy. This is the form of piety. People are giving God lip service, all right? They say they love God. They say they're going to worship God, but their hearts are not with God. God is looking for people who can worship him in spirit and in truth. Form of godliness. That's hypocrisy rejected. And here is the conclusion, my friends. And I know you guys are going to get your brother can get ready to play this song as we're about to pray. You must make up your mind. You must make up your mind. And the message tonight is directed towards just that. Make a decision who are you going to serve. I just explained to you who God is that you may worship him. Question is, you must, are you going to make up your mind? The Bible says you must make a decision. You have only two choices. Jesus, God said, behold, I put before you life and death. But I, I, you can choose whatever you want. You have the free will. You have the freedom to choose. But then God said, I highly recommend you choose life. Choose life. And now, here's the, appeal. Here's the, here's the, here's the conclusion. Romans chapter 1, 1825. I'm just going to read that for you as we come to a close right now. Here's what it says. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of the people who suppress the truth 
by their wickedness. Since what we may be, since what may be known about God is made plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, God's invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been made clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. Question tonight is what's your excuse for not giving your heart, your whole heart to worship God, the creator of heaven and earth. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God, nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles, my God. They would rather worship images of animals rather than worship the true. Not even animals, they worship images of animals rather than worshiping the one true God. Therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for lie. They would rather believe the lies rather than believe truth about God. And they worship and serve created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. Amen. So they would rather worship created things. They worship images, not even the real things. Images rather than worshiping the one true God. Tonight, the question is, who is God that I may worship? And tonight, I reveal to you. God has revealed to you through the words who he is. Now it's the same this song before we pray. Decide in your heart. Are you going to choose today to serve God, the creator of heaven and earth? Or are you going to choose to serve and worship something else? You decide. But as for me and my house, like Joshua, I'm just going to praise God. Just to know the safe the to stand up with us as we're about to come to a close and pray the final prayer. But before I pray this final prayer, I'm making this appeal to you. I would ever want to stand up if you can, please. But let me make this appeal to you tonight. If you're here and you would like to recommend to serve and worship the one true God, the creator of heaven and earth, and you hear the message tonight, God is speaking to you and say, I am the creator. I am God. My name is God and I'm the God. There is none besides me. If you'd like to come and make this commitment tonight, I'll invite you to come forward and pray with us. And as well as for those who are watching live, and if you have not made peace with God yet, you have not invited God to be Lord and Savior of your life, Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I'm asking you to make this commitment now. Now while we're praying, get down on your knees and say, Lord, I am committed to praise and worship you for the rest of my life because now I learned tonight that there's only one God 
There's only one God, one true God. I am tired of believing lies. I'm tired of, be, of, of worshiping idols and statues. And I'm tired of chasing money. I'm ready to be attached to my God. I'm ready to give my life to God. If that's your prayer, if that's the desire of your heart, I now invite you to bow your heads with me. If you would like to come closer, you may come closer. If you would like to stay where you are, just you can stay where you are. That's okay. That's okay. But let's, let us have a word of prayer. My God. My God. Thank you for speaking to us tonight. Thank you for revealing who you are and why we must worship you. Father, if some of us were in doubt as far as who is God that we may worship him, tonight we learn who you are. You are the creator of heaven and earth. You are the omnipresent God. You are the omnipotent God. You are the all good God. You are the God who sees everything. You are the God who knows our name. Thank you, Father God, for everything you have done in our lives. Thank you for the sacrifice of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that now we know because of him standing on your right hand, we can come boldly before the throne of grace, knowing that whatsoever we ask in the name of Jesus, we shall receive it. And thank you for giving us power in the name of Jesus that we can heal the sick. We can save the, those who are dying without a Savior. Thank you for giving us the power to attack the kingdom of the enemy no matter where he is we can come now we can go after him so it's not the church of god running away from the enemy but the enemy running away from the church of god thank you for this power because we know there's power in your name we know there's power in the name of Jesus. We know there is a power to break every chain. The chain of emotional bondage. The chain of physical bondage. The chain of spiritual bondage. The chain of, of psychological bondage. We know that there's power in the name of Jesus to break every chain. So tonight, we ask him, Father God, to break our chain. Yes. Set us free, oh God, that we may worship you. Set us free, oh God, that we may praise you. Set us free, oh God. That we may testify of your goodness and greatness. Set us free, O oh God. That we may represent you before men and before God. Yes. Hear our prayers, O oh God. Incline your ears to us. And may you grant us your everlasting peace. And as we depart from this place, I declare your eternal shalom on your children being here tonight, Father God. Help us, guide us, and spread your protection over us. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.